listening to the North Peace MB Church Roundtable Podcast. For more information, visit npmbchurch.com. Hmm. Well, you are listening to the North Peace Roundtable Podcast, episode, oh man, 29. 29, I think. Yeah. 29. Um, so thank you for either listening on iTunes or Spotify or wherever you listen or watch it on YouTube. I think we got one new subscriber this week, guys. We're Ooh. almost to our 100 subscriber plaque. Do we actually have those mugs yet? I can't wait till our oh, man. podcasts start playing ads. Then we know we've made it. When you see like a <laughs> cell phone ad before our podcast. <laughs> All right. I got 18 cents from that. <laughs> yes. <laughs> but anyways, uh, my name is Andrew. And with me as always is Corland. Hello. Hello. And Cameron. Good morning, everyone. And so, yeah, if you are uh, new to the podcast, um, there's lots that you can go back and listen to. You can binge our podcast. Ooh. <laughs> you mm-hmm. can listen to the first episode where it was terrible quality and no video, and now here we are. So um, what we do is talk about um, theology or doctrine or you know something to do with Christianity and the Bible and following Jesus and kind of unpack it and dialogue about it. So... Uh, I would encourage you to go back and listen to past episodes. I think they're pretty good, um, but I'm biased. Sure. <laughs> uh, anyway, for today, actually, I have an announcement to make, oh. uh, an important milestone in our family's life. We are now baby gate free. Oh, wow. Took the baby gates down last night, and my son fell down this... No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> That's the only way to learn. That's the only way to learn. I just kind of push them and see, put your hands out. See if I'm just kidding. I'm not a terrible parent. But anyways, it was a milestone. We just went, hey, we don't have to deal with this nonsense anymore. My favorite milestone was the diapers ending. The purchasing of diapers and then uh, strollers. Yeah. You're like, you can walk now. My (laughs) wife doesn't need diapers. So it's okay. (laughs) I thought Corley, hey, me too. Yeah. (laughs) Anyways, um, this is not a parenting podcast. We should do an episode about parenting, right? Corlin, you yeah. give us your wisdom. I'll tell you guys how to do it. Yeah. Isn't that the the experts at parenting always have no kids? <laughs> <laughs> it's true. Man. Uh, anyways, um, today we want to talk about the day of the Lord and that um, theme uh, throughout scripture. And I guess the reason that it uh, kind of came up in my mind and I threw that idea out to you guys was um, uh, if you go to the the MB Church, for a while we've been looking at um, the minor prophets in the Old Testament and um, that uh, literal phrase, the day of the Lord, or that idea or topic comes up a lot in not just the minor prophets, but in the prophetic books of the Bible. And so I... Uh, I think it was a few Sundays ago, I explained very quickly on Sunday morning, you know, this is what the day of the Lord means. But I, I thought it would be good because it's such a big theme in the Bible. I thought it would be good to um, kind of unpack it a little bit more here for the next little bit. So yeah. um, I guess as a way of starting, um, what do you guys think? If you could give a definition of... This is what the day of the Lord is. Or even like growing up, was that a common thing that you heard within your Christian circles, guys? The the day, Honestly, I can say no. I never heard that kind of phrase. It was either like, um, it was always classified as like Armageddon. So did did you get like the end times preaching? Yeah, but never, it was never connected to like the day of the Lord. It was just like, oh, the rapture left behind. Mm. Don't you know, miss the apocalypse or whatever like that, which I think is actually a misunderstanding of the day of the Lord, but we'll get to that. Um, But I don't know if you were to somehow define it or I don't know, give a little bit of your history with that kind of concept in the Bible. I don't know. I, I think I'd have to say that my, my experience lines up quite a bit with yours. It's not that like anybody that I knew would like, stand there and be like the day of the Lord is coming the day of the Lord yeah, and like, like their sandwich board. On yeah. <laughs> like I, I wasn't exposed to that a whole bunch. Not when I was younger anyways. Um, yeah. I do know of people and, and churches that, and know of people that go to those churches where end times is a huge topic of discussion and mm-hmm. it's always talked about or, or preached on. Um, so in that sense, I guess you could say the day of the Lord has been something that has been talked about, but it's always, I don't know. I guess in my experience, I would have to describe it as almost like 
they use the day of the Lord like a boogeyman story where it's like, hey, you better watch out. You like, better not cry. <laughs> like something's coming. And, and it's not actually like there's there's no change that comes forth. There's just like almost a fear that we have to make sure we're ready for it. Sure. When if you're saved and you're following Christ, you are ready for it. There's no. Sure. You don't have to button up your shirt to the right button. You don't have to tie your tie. So like. I don't know. I think it's been used as a boogeyman story to make sure that people are quote unquote ready for when God returns. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's been my, um, it's been my sense also. And if I think through my experience, it's, it's well, even if it wasn't intentionally like a boogeyman story, it was like they were missing the point almost in some churches where we read in the old Testament and in the new Testament, when you, when you see the language around it, I almost view it as like, this great victory, like this, mm-hmm. this, <clears throat> not so much this scare tactic, but the day of the Lord, when all of this fades, when, you know, we see this, you know, true victory, but yeah, throughout church history in the West, at least far too often, I think it's been made to be like, you know, yet, yeah, and, and there's language in the new Testament where it's like, be prepared. You never yeah, know. Yeah. 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 <clears throat> Fine. That's different. The fear of the Lord is different than being afraid of the Lord. Yeah. And yeah, that's yeah. how I yeah. think that it's been misinterpreted where, yeah, we have to be fearful, but they've got that wrong too, where the fear of the Lord is, and that would be a good, actually, um, we may have covered it before, but that would be a good conversation to unpack a little bit too. Like what yeah. does it mean to have a, a healthy fear of the Lord? <clears throat> and I think when you look uh, at scripture through that lens, you actually see like a healthy fear of the day of the Lord, where it's like this incredible victory. And a, and a caution that comes with that mm-hmm. to ensure that you're a part of that incredible yeah. victory, that, that victorious celebration almost when the heavens open, when the sky goes dark. Like it's, I'm, I'm really glad that you pointed out that it's, it's a victory. Like there's, there's the day of the Lord isn't an imminent bad thing that's coming, right? Like it shouldn't, yes, there's, like you said, things we need to prepare for, but because it's a victory, we shouldn't be using it as a scare tactic. Like what we were saying, it's something to be, waiting for in hope that it's coming right because it's it's a good thing when god judges people right yeah so here's here's how i think the day of the lord is um talked about in the western world in north america um and here's why i think it's slightly wrong um lots of times we read uh prophets like prophetic books in the bible and we view the day of the lord as uh not yet happened like never happened um it's a future event and now we have to like decipher um all these prophetic images and connect them to these future events uh and so we read uh the second half of the book of daniel because that's the weird stuff right (coughs) and then we read certain images and oh locusts mean uh black hawk helicopters and blah 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 and we try and decipher because we view that the day of the Lord is a one-time event that has not yet happened, and we have to decipher all these, you know, Hosea, Joel, Amos, Obadiah, Jonah. Well, I guess not really Jonah. That's about, but you know, you know what I mean. Yeah. And Zephaniah and Zechariah, and we have to like decipher because all of that has yet to happen. I I think that's actually, go back and watch Da Vinci Code again. <laughs> yeah, yeah, maybe. Right? See if I missed something. <laughs> yeah. So I think that's actually not a proper view of the day of the Lord. Um, Um, I I think a good definition would be um, the day of the Lord is any time that God manifests his power in judgment against a nation or a people group, but also like it's been said, but also like with this element of rescue in it, Mm -hmm. right? So I actually believe biblically speaking, there have been many days of the Lord. Um, And actually the first one that uses that kind of language not specifically the day of the Lord, but the day is the Exodus. Yeah. So, and you think about the Exodus, ex- the Exodus is a really interesting story. So God's people are slaves in Egypt. And then um, God comes against Egypt in judgment through these 10 plagues. And he saves his people, Israel, right? Brings them through the Red Sea. Um, he's leading them to the promised land. And every Israelite, would call what happened in the Exodus. They called it the day. Mm -hmm. That's what they would call it. Hey, remember the day. And it was kind of like 
that's a super significant day in our, and they would celebrate every year with the Passover. This is how I want you to remember the day, um, do this Passover meal. So, so there's an example, right? Where, um, there's a day of the Lord that's already happened. It's not future. It's the Exodus. God saves uh, his people and renders judgment against evil. Really? That's kind of the theme. Anytime God mm -hmm. renders judgment against evil and saves people, um, that is called or seen as um, either that day or the day or a day of the Lord. Hmm. So I think sometimes we do like a disservice to the Bible when we're like, um, the day of the Lord is only one thing that has yet to happen. And it's kind of like very self-centered, like we're the most important people, right? When hmm. um, I think lots in the prophetic books in the Old Testament uh, my my opinion, I guess, is that lots of it has already happened. Like lots of it you can still learn from and glean um, principles and truths from. But like when when Joel talks about the day of the Lord and locusts and famine coming, that like happened already. Uh, yeah, those those physical, tangible things. Yeah, already it took place. Passed. And I don't think when Joel stood up and said, like, repent, the day of the Lord is near. He wasn't thinking 3000 years later for him. It was literally guys like mm. there's an in invading army the day of the lord is coming <clears throat> in judgment you need to like mm -hmm. repent and even more so to unpack that joel was not looking at a second coming of the lord either and so when i read some of that mm -hmm. and you think to the coming like to the literal jesus being born god coming to earth like that is a day of the lord from what i see through um some of that language i mean that's a real here and then manifestation of the Lord actually coming to earth. Yeah. Because the second coming in that whole doctrine wouldn't have been known to Old Testament prophets in that way. Totally. So that's a conflict too when you're thinking from start of the Bible to end of the Bible, thinking about the actual day of judgment at the end of the age. Um, while it's referenced in that way, I, I don't see them looking through that lens, looking down the road thousands of years. Mm -hmm. It's always read quite like you said, quite imminently, like right in front of them. Mm -hmm. The day of the Lord is coming near. And we see that throughout Israel's history of judgment, defeat, victory. I think they would have, the priests in the temple would have been saying like the day of the Lord is upon us, mm -hmm. you know, repent. Um, so that language, <clears throat> I think we can get caught up in. And like how you said, making it about us because it's almost every, we see every generation throughout history saying, these are the end times. This, <laughs> yeah. is, this is when the Lord is going to come for us and yeah. our children and our family. And it's a very kind of. Uh, well, even like, so think about our, our day and age. I, I hear so many Christians. This is it guys. And like, right. could it be? Yeah, sure. It Absolutely. could be, but to be like, Oh, and then like, Oh, that the, this is that. And the, the vaccine is the mark of the bee. The, oh, it all makes sense. It's like every generation had the same people, you know, cracking the same quote unquote codes and being like, it's here. Right. And then it fades and it passes and you go, oh, okay. So it wasn't the end. So could it be? Sure. Any, any generation could be the last one. We don't know, right? but not necessarily. So, um, I want to jump back though, because here's, what's interesting. So, um, God saves the Israelites from Egypt and that's considered the first kind of day of the Lord. And then um, here's here's where the story um, gets super interesting because if you think about Egypt, God comes against Egypt because it's evil, right? Um, it uh, had slavery. It was trying to kill the firstborn males of their immigrant population. Mm -hmm. So like they're committing uh, what's it? Is that infanticide? Not genocide. Infanticide. Whatever it is, when you kill babies. Um, oh, I don't know. I've never looked into that, to be honest. <laughs> yeah, it's not like a, a <laughs> no, hobby of yours. No. I think it's called infanticide. But like, okay. Mm. Um, Hit some triggers on my Google search. <laughs> yeah, right. Um, but so that there's this, it's this evil nation. Right. And then what happens is God saves his people. And then um, they come to the promised land. And you have King David eventually, right? And he's this great king uh, for the most part. <laughs> mm -hmm. And, uh, and then his son Solomon becomes King. And if you know the story, Solomon, God comes to him and says like, you know, you can ask for whatever you want. And Solomon asks for wisdom. And so God says, well, because you asked for wisdom, I'll give you all the other stuff too, because mm -hmm. you're so humble and blah, 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 blah. And then, and then what you begin to see though is Israel 
turns into a nation just like Egypt. It's really fascinating. Mm -hmm. Solomon builds uh, mm -hmm. the temple. And then <clears throat> in 1 Kings, it talks about, um, I think it's 1 Kings 6. Solomon builds the temple, which is like, this is where God's presence is going to dwell. Like, that's pretty important, right? Mm -hmm. right. And at the end of 1 Kings 6, it says uh, he was seven years in building it. It took Solomon seven years to build the temple. The very next chapter, it says Solomon was building his own house for 13 years. So you go, whoa, wait a second. So right. he spent seven years on the, the literal dwelling place of the God of the universe. And then he spends almost double that on his own house. And you go, well, that's hmm. kind of odd. And then um, later on, it talks about that Solomon began to use forced labor to, so exactly like Egypt, I'm going to use slaves to build my own temple. And you go, well, wait a second. Like, isn't that what God punished Egypt for? Because they were cruel and wicked and they used slave labor. And now you go, oh man, Solomon's doing the exact same thing. Um, and then you get to second Chronicles where it talks about, um, Solomon's wealth and you just kind of go, oh boy, um, Solomon, you've kind of like gone off the deep end here. Sorry. I'm trying to open up a, I had a, some passages written down here, but he goes way beyond, right? It says that he made 200 large shields of beaten gold. 600 shekels of gold went into each shield. He made a great ivory throne for himself and overlaid it with pure gold. The throne had six steps and a footstool of gold. And on each side of the seats were armrests and two lions standing behind. And 12 lions stood at the end of each step. Nothing like it was ever made for any kingdom. So no kingdom in the world had a throne <laughs> for their king like Solomon had. And so you start to go, oh man, Israel is turning into Egypt. They're sure. turning into this evil nation using slave labor, exalting their kings, not God. And then um, the prophets began to talk about the day of the Lord, right? Exactly a a a what they talked about in the past. And yet every Israelite in their mind, the day of the Lord was God defeats evil and he rescues us. So when, when the prophets would say like the day of the Lord is near, any Israelite would have gone sweet, right? Babylon's gone. Assyria has gone. The Philistines are gone. Not us. Right? right. Because they didn't, they were blind to the fact that actually you've become evil Israel. Right. Mm -hmm. um, so I find that super fascinating. This that God saves them from an evil nation and they turn into that nation that they were saved from. Right. Um, and then Amos comes. I know I'm talking a lot and I want to hear That's you guys' good. opinion. But Amos comes along and Amos is the first prophet chronologically who talks literally the day of the Lord. And uh, basically what Amos says is, um, woe to you who desire the day of the Lord. Right? And, and that's Amos 5, 18. Why, why would you have the day of the Lord? It's darkness and not light. And then he kind of, you know, it says if uh, a man fled from a, bear, a lion and a bear met him and went into a house and leaned his hand against the wall and a serpent bit him. Like, it's pretty, it's actually quite funny. Like, can you imagine running away from a lion and then you meet a bear and then you like escape the bear and go into a house and as you're like leaning against the wall, catching your breath, <laughs> a snake bites you. It's like, man, that sucks. Um, but the whole point is Amos is saying to the people, um, why are you excited about the day of the Lord? Because the day of the Lord is when God comes against evil and that's you guys, right? That would have blown everyone's mind Sure. in Israel. That's um, why most prophets weren't very popular. <laughs> 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 yeah, that's true, right? Yeah. Um, and so you have Amos, right? Who at the beginning of Amos, he, he, God pronounces judgment on all these other nations. And everyone in Israel would have applauded and said, woohoo. And that's why Amos says, you guys should not be excited about the day of the Lord, right? right? If the day of the Lord is any time God comes against evil, um, he's coming against you. And that kind of rocked people's worlds a little bit, I think. And yet it's interesting because they, like, I can understand where they would have been coming from because I think we all think we're perfect and we all think we're great. But then when we hear that we're not, it's like, wait, what? But yet the day of the Lord in biblical context, like we've been talking about, 
is God rescuing people from evil sure. and pronouncing judgment on it. So if the day of the Lord was against Israel because they had become a nation of evil, it makes sense. Like it's not, it's, it shouldn't have surprised them if they had mm. actually quote unquote checked their heart and seen <laughs> what they were doing. Check right. Your, check your heart. <laughs> yeah. And I think um, they, their, their picture of the day of the Lord was so wrapped up in the Exodus and that was this great moment where God did save them. And so mm-hmm. they would go like, well, God's promised that he would always be our God and that we're his people. And that when, the, when, when they would hear something like the day of the Lord, their minds, I think, would automatically go back to the Exodus and go, great. Now Assyria is kind of threatening us. The day of the Lord's coming. It'll probably be exactly like the Exodus mm-hmm. where God destroys Assyria and he saves us again. Right. So. Mm-hmm. That's why the, like, like you said, Cam, that's why the prophets were hated. Mm-hmm. And that's why even in Amos, I think it's Amos 7, uh, the priest and the king both say to Amos, like, get out of here. Like, go prophesy somewhere else. We don't, we won't want to hear this basically because it didn't fit their, their worldview. Like, think about it today. It, you know, um, um, the United States kind of views itself as, you know, we're God's chosen nation, blah, 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 blah. And it would be the same as like someone, and I don't know if they do, being like, no, actually God's um, like, like angry with you, America, and mm-hmm. God is coming in judgment against you. For the most part, lots of even Christians in America would be like, no, there's no way. There's no way. Look at all the good that we do, and we're not bad, and we're God's chosen. Look at our foundation. All of the forefathers were Christians, and blah, 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 right? Mm-hmm. It would be that kind of startling. Mm-hmm. And then if it actually happened, everyone would go, what? Mm-hmm. What in the world? That's kind of a similar thing with Israel. Israel was like, we're untouchable. We're God's chosen people. We can do whatever we want. And... Oh, a, a prophet saying the day of the Lord is coming. Well, it's clearly not about us. It's about all of our enemies that are going to be conquered. And then they were totally wiped out, <laughs> right? Um, Assyria wipes out Israel in the 700s, and Babylon wipes out Judah in the early or late early 500s. And it's like, what? What happened? And everyone's left reeling, going, mm-hmm. "We're God's chosen people." Like. Mm-hmm. How is God against us? So you're right, Corlin. I think they were somewhat blind to the sin and idolatry and wickedness. Like if someone had said, yeah, Israel, you're just like Egypt. They would have been like, whoa, settle down. No, we're not. We're not that bad. Right. So, so then where do we go from there? Like, cause it's, uh, let's just say like, you know, um, is the day of the Lord talked about in the new Testament? Um, or is it like Assyrian Babylon wipe out Israel and then it's mm-hmm. kind of like, you know, the day of the Lord's over? Or is it a continual thing? Well, I feel like the um, there's such <clears throat> conflict in language, like the coming of the Lord, the day of the Lord. So the yeah. way you described Israel is much the way we see them interacting with the person of Jesus and not recognizing what that day of the Lord looks like either. Cause they're still waiting for a physical um, <clears throat> victory that defeats their enemies. And that's obvious. We we've talked before about mm-hmm. their view of kingship and what that victory looks like. And so I think that it would be, it would have been confusing um, for the disciples in that time to be thinking about this great day of the Lord I think they would have missed it in the birth of Jesus because they didn't see this great victory and then missed it again in the death of Jesus on the cross yeah. because their idea of this day of the Lord was wrapped up in that Exodus story and in that um, that physical victory, freedom right in front of them mm-hmm. where um, we have the privilege of reading back and looking back and seeing like, I think you missed a great coming of the Lord, that day of the Lord where... Mm-hmm. Not only was then when was Jesus born, but then in the death of Christ on the cross, where you see the ground shaking and the sky turning to dark, you know the rumblings, the the dead rising, and yeah. we read some of that language in the Bible, and we think about the end of the age, the second coming of Christ, and and mm-hmm. the and the great tribulation. But it's like, well, that that was definitely a day of the Lord when yeah. when mm-hmm. when God redeemed thousands of years of broken covenants, like we touched on a few weeks ago, mm-hmm. and and this new. Um, covenant was was then sealed with the death of jesus on the cross so 
Um, I think the disciples missed that day of the Lord Mm -hmm. (laughs) and then continued to talk about it through a new lens, though, of the second coming of Christ. And that's where I think we get into more of the, I think, more of the end of the age language just because Jesus prepares this way of Mm -hmm. actually, um, okay, I'm going to realign all of that history that you have and actually show that it's going to be a little different. And if the disciples were to miss the, the, the true essence of that victory, uh, we have to be very careful that we, like we already touched on, don't miss that also, that it's not this great day of fear, but this great day of spiritual victory. Yeah, mm-hmm. victory. for sure. Uh, it comes with humility. It comes with patience. It comes with, um, you know, a, a true sense of navigating our own salvation like we touched on last week. And um, I love uh, in Thessalon- Second Thessalonians where it talks about... Um, just when, it, when we're speaking about language of the end of the age, mm-hmm. and how not to be quickly shaken in mind or alarmed either by a spirit or by a spoken word or a letter seeming to be from us yeah. to the effect that the day of the Lord has come. Let no one deceive you in any way. Because right now we're living in this age of like, we can look back over the last 20 years and see all of these doomsday prophets, these end yeah. of the age, um, you know, the day of judgment is coming, the day of the Lord is coming. And I just feel like, you know, well, you've missed it also. So the day of the Lord has come, you know, in the, like, in, in the most recent for us, like the birth of Christ, the death of Christ, these are days of the Lord. Victory is shown and manifested. And then, yeah, there will be another day of the Lord, much like we, we are pointed to, mm-hmm. but it's, um, yeah, I don't know how to, I don't know how to relay my thoughts well but i've said before like the writers of scripture they're they're also thinking that that day of the lord the second coming of christ is like eminent like Mm -hmm. it's prepared now (coughs) Mm -hmm. and they were not writing for us today so there's no sense going through and trying to unpack these secret codes that they would have been using because they're writing from their heart feeling the spirit impressed upon them that the day of the lord is near and that's like I've said before, the miracle of the Bible is that it is real and alive today. Yeah. <laughs> but not written by those humans for today. They weren't thinking about our podcast this morning when John's writing Revelation. <laughs> what? They weren't thinking about <laughs> how, you know, how it, they were inspired by the Spirit to, to write this these impressions. And, you know, for us to unpack that today, like, wow, there's some code where, you know, my kids are going to see, you know, I'm not, oh, I don't have to die of sickness because the the Jesus is coming in my generation. Mm -hmm. It's like John thought that sitting on that island when he was writing, like, oh, yeah, be prepared now. Second coming is here. Yeah. Um, Yeah. So I think, too, like we're to just to be clear when I'm when I've said, like, there's there's been multiple days of the Lord. I do. I do believe that there is a final day of the Lord that's coming. Yeah. Right, whether you want to call it the capital D Day of the Lord, which the but but all the narrative in the Bible is like pushing towards that final one. Because mm-hmm. if you think about it, a day of the Lord is when God deals with evil. These are just isolated. God deals with Egypt. God deals with His own people. God deals with Babylon and Assyria. But it's not this like uh, universe-wide dealing of evil. Mm-hmm. It's an expression of the Day of the Lord that God's dealing with that people group or whatever but you read that when jesus returns he's going to deal with evil and sin final judgment finally for the last time for the last time right and so all of uh, all of history is kind of inching us closer to that right so Mm -hmm. i i just think we got to be cautious right we don't want to say that like it's okay to be, you know, there have been multiple days of the Lord and there still is one more coming, right? <laughs> I would argue yeah. the capital day of the Lord might have been the death on the cross where evil was dealt its, sure. f- its blow, defeated, victory on the cross was assured and, and it was done. And then there will be, there'll be this final cleanse if you want to call. <laughs> <laughs> We're Sounds going- so awful. <laughs> um, the purge. <laughs> Yeah, there's been some movies but but um, so like <laughs> oh man so even think about it though all the all the prophets not all of them but many of them talked about the day when god himself would come right the messiah and they and deal with their enemies and like you've already mentioned then mm-hmm. like jesus comes mm-hmm. and he is the complete 
opposite of what they thought because he's not a, a warrior he's not an insurrectionist he's not a he's a teacher and, yeah in their view he wouldn't have been a king no he's just he's a rabbi he's a teacher and what does he do he goes around, but what is like he says the first thing after his uh fasting in the wilderness he says repent the kingdom of heaven is near and everyone goes oh snap like this is it it's coming and then he goes and he casts out demons and he heals people and he says i forgive your sins and he teaches people how to love their enemies and everyone goes like it's like you can hear the wah wah yeah. everyone is going wait what yeah but the kingdom of heaven was near it, because as yeah. soon as he uh ascended and the holy spirit descended like that's the kingdom of yeah. heaven. And so how available does available yeah. now in yep. personal relationship with the God of the universe? Best life now. Oh shut up. <laughs> <laughs> and strike and strike. <laughs> anyway. Oh man, yeah. Um but that is that's not he's not pointing to thousands of years yeah. later. Yeah. Yeah. The kingdom of heaven is near. Like in in thirty six months I'm gonna die on the cross and you're gonna be given a great counselor, a great comforter. This my spirit will be among you, inside you, like, and that's where we've talked, touched on before when we talk about salvation, or we we we, we want to point someone to the the Christ. We often dilute it with, "Hey, guess what happens when you die after mm -hmm. this age?" We don't say like, "Today, you can have the kingdom of heaven." Yeah, guess what happens today when you right. accept? And and that's that's it's often missed because we do much like. Uh, much like the entire biblical narrative point to something coming yeah. and forget about like actually today you can have eternal hope today mm -hmm. you can meet the god of the universe and have the kingdom of heaven inside you you can start your best life today <laughs> <laughs> Coral Holstein here. <laughs> <laughs> but it's amazing like how does jesus because we would say that his coming was the Messiah. It was God himself coming to deal with sin and evil, but it's amazing how he deals with it. He deals with it by being killed, right? He doesn't come. Uh, he does the opposite of what everyone, wait, you're going to allow yourself to be crucified. And that's you dealing with the problem of sin and evil. Mm -hmm. Like we, we would assume that God would do what he did in the past days of the Lord. When I wipe out Assyria and I wipe out Babylon and I wipe out Israel they were expecting the Messiah to come and wipe out Rome, right? And then, mm. boom, we're in. But Jesus goes and he's crucified. And that is what the Bible says. That's how God deals with sin and evil, by completely counterintuitive way. I'm actually going to let myself be killed. And then what's fascinating to me is that in the book of Revelation, in chapter 5, um, there's this image and, and it says, uh, and we won't get into all the the imagery but you know who's worthy to open the scroll which means who's worthy to like put god's plan of redemption into action his plan to conquer evil and sin and give redemption to his people and it says no one in heaven and earth can open it and then john starts crying because he goes well we're we're screwed no mm -hmm. one can do this and then the angel says no wait behold the lion of the tribe of judah and so you have an image of like okay it's go time right yeah. warrior he can open the scroll and then he says, John turned and looked, and what did he see? A lamb, a lamb, a lamb. who had been slain. So literally yeah. like a mutilated lamb sitting on the throne. And you go, like, scratch your head. Like, mm -hmm. this is the, the great warrior. Well, that's how God conquered through yeah. the, the death of his son. And you just kind of go, oh, man. It's just so amazing, right, that God deals with sin and evil this way. And that's why... Besides um, the the disciples after the Holy Spirit was given, that's why no one understood it, right? Even right. even when Jesus rises from the dead and meets with them, they go, "Now are you going to restore the kingdom to Israel?" And it, right. you, I can just see like Jesus face palming, right? <laughs> that's right? Because they still did, until the Holy Spirit was given, nobody got it. They just went, right. "Wait, what? I don't understand, Jesus." And if yeah, if. You're listening and a little confused. I think it's a good jump back to our covenant uh, yeah, two-part totally. series mm -hmm. where why was Jesus slain? And you see that, just a super quick recap, coming back to essentially be the perfect yeah. Israelite, the perfect person to then die as part of that covenant. Totally. And, and then God's end of it is that there will be a day. There will be 
an end to all of this. And now mm-hmm. we are in right covenant because of the sacrifice yeah. that he made. So just an incredible imagery around, okay, such such amazing grace and such great love that, and we, you know, John 3.16 has been kind of, it's been in some sense diluted and not given its full weight. Like he through this incredible love not only sent his son but sent to die in place of this he could have just done another yeah he could have reacted on his or regate on his covenants and just said you know what, i'm done like it's just enough you guys you don't get it you know generation after generation Mm yeah i'm tired Uh, (laughs) you know face palm but no he provides a means to actually create this new perfect covenant where it's Mm -hmm. over now and so like if you're not seeing that as a great day of the Lord, defeat over evil and, and like the beginning of yeah. the end, then then don't miss that because yeah. that's, that's super yeah. important. Because, yeah, when Jesus was crucified, that was a day of the Lord. Absolutely. Because like you said, if you read the accounts, there's so much prophetic imagery mm-hmm. that is repeated throughout the Bible that you go. Okay, and and what is uh, Jesus being crucified? It's God dealing with evil, but He's dealing with it by punishing His own Son. Yeah, there's judgment there. Right? Yeah, there's ju- and that's what the day of the Lord is. It's when God comes in judgment to rescue His people, and that's exactly what the cross is, right? And so as Jesus hangs on the cross, the sky goes black, like you said. The uh, earth trembles. Rocks split. The temple itself is like messed up, and the the curtain is torn. Yeah, dead people rise from the dead, mm-hmm. and you go. That's all prophetic day of the lord imagery that the prophets used and it's happening when jesus was crucified so you go okay a great day of the lord just took place right and that's why i think even the um the centurion he saw all that happen and he goes uh yeah okay truly this was the son of god like this is not a normal dude that we just crucified (laughs) we killed a lot of people but that's never happened yeah the the earth doesn't split open when we kill robbers Mm. Mm. okay something's going on here right mm-hmm. and i love that a roman centurion kind of partially got it like and everyone else is what happened <laughs> sorry that's a bad israelite impression <laughs> oh man <laughs> that's good so then now for us today because we want to make this practical mm-hmm. like so then how, like how does this okay jesus has come once and the day of the lord is uh, yet to happen, right? It has, the day of the Lord has happened multiple times and yet you and I and people listening, we're still waiting for that last final day of the mm-hmm. Lord. Mm-hmm. So do we stockpile weapons and uh, food? <laughs> no, or <we're> pacifistic. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, he said we, oh, he's in, all right. <laughs> right. Um, um, or like what? Do we live in fear of being left behind or like like what practically do we not even think about it because we're like we're in we don't have to think about the day of the lord like there's interesting um there's interesting narratives being spread and one of Mm -hmm. i i spoke to someone like look at all the death and destruction you know today like it's so obvious that the end is near and i read an article and, and heard another person speaking like actually like globally there's less death today than any time in human history yeah, uh, like actually, and that just just a touching on that one point, like actually less people being killed sure. um, through violence than any time in human history. But you'll read about it; it's just in your face daily. Mm-hmm. This consumption of this negativity, or not even negativity, just this consumption of these negative f- vibes, even facts of of awful things that happen because that's what sells. Mm-hmm. Um, so you can't just rest on like, oh, we're living in such an evil time because you can see easily throughout scripture, like there's every generation yeah. at any point, God could have come back and say, okay, enough is enough. Let's, let's, let's do this. Um, but I think for us as, as people who are, um, you know, secured in our salvation, we do have a, um, mission we are given a job we do have an active role in that while we don't know the day we have an active responsibility to to be sharing the gospel and i don't want anyone running around with their wedge board signs saying you know 
come to Christ now the end of the the end of the age is near but you should but I think that should propel some of yeah. our engagement and yeah. some of the reason why we serve the reason why we love intentionally but we can get into trouble with that too because I think it's a it's first has to come from a heart check like you know, am I doing this to save someone's soul or do I actually care about their culture, their person, their being, their family, their, the way they, mm. they live their life? Yeah. Because I think then that's done wrong too. And that's one of the biggest mistakes that evangelical Christians have made in the past is mm -hmm. that I just want to save your soul and I don't care about the rest of you. It's yeah. just important to make sure you get to heaven. Yeah, That's not the point either um, yeah. because yeah. we're selling something to come and we're not showing them something that can change today. And I think yeah. that for me, I think that every Christian has had their day of the Lord where actually God came down, and touched your rescued heart, rescued them, rescued you, helped you conquer sin by, yeah, by giving definitely. you this salvation and an eternal hope. Mm. So we've had our days of the Lord. Why should we not want for someone, for our brother to experience a day of the Lord for himself and then point to a time where, listen, I know it's broken. I know it's difficult. We have this eternal hope now. And that eternal hope is that on the final day of the Lord, um, you know, w it, he'll wash away your tears. There mm -hmm. will be no sin, no pain, and no death. And so that's like a, I view that as like how that impacts our day to day. Uh, it shouldn't too much. We should just have this, this humble assurance, this confident in some ways assurance that, okay, today I can experience the fullness of Jesus. And there's going to even be a more fullness uh, and a greater fullness of Jesus when I can see him face to face. But yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. I, I think you've summarized it pretty well. I have a bunch of thoughts jumbled in my head, so I'll try and spit them spit out, spit them out word as salad. best as I can. <laughs> yeah, word salad. Um, <laughs> Prophecy bingo. <laughs> yeah, I I think that there's definitely a balance that can be struck with with thinking or or wondering or learning about end time stuff because there is definitely a part of me that would say it doesn't matter because of what Jesus has already done. Like it matters that he's going to return. Mm -hmm. It matters that he's going to have one final day of the Lord and wipe out sin once and for all like that, that matters. But I think if we get so caught up on that, like you touched on Cameron, we can, we can preach that that's going to happen rather than what's already happened. And that that brings us into the kingdom of God already. Um, and, and I would, the reason I, I, I kind of sit where I would say that it almost, we, we can make it matter too much, so to speak, like in, in how we talk to people is because even if you read the New Testament, the main focus of the New Testament is the gospel and how to spread the gospel effectively. Yes, we have a full book on Revelation or, or what it could look like or will look like when the end time comes. But the most of the New Testament is how to spread the gospel. Like even uh, the gospel affects your standings on that final day. But I, I just, I don't know. I struggle to, to see sharing the gospel as saying, guys, look out. This is coming rather than say, guys, look at what's already come and I look at like how Jesus, this affects yeah. you then. And yeah. I feel like he made it that obvious by saying like, no one knows today. It's almost like yeah. prepare, but yeah, don't. Jesus says, yeah. I don't even know, right. which is kind of interesting. And I would say even... Uh, the book of Revelation um, is not, here's how it's all going to end. Yeah, yeah. No. You've read it wrong. The book of Revelation is, here's how to be faithful through every generation, regardless of what persecution is going on. Um, I think we read the book of Revelation wrong when we read it chronologically and, and say, prescriptively like and yep. this is how yep. the end is going to happen. It's like, well, that's not even meant to be read like that. Yeah. Um, for John, when he saw the vision and he's writing to these seven literal churches, it was, here's how to remain faithful as you're being persecuted by Rome mm -hmm. in 90 AD or whatever it was. Now it applies to every generation, but, um, so I would say there's two passages in the New Testament, and there might be more, but that tell us about the day of the Lord. First Thessalonians five, which basically says, I won't read all of it, but it's going to happen like that. Um, I don't, I'll, it's going to happen. I don't know if you Final that. snap. Yeah. Oh man. Like that. And then the thing is, let us not sleep as others do. Let us keep awake and be sober. And the very end of first Thessalonians five, um, says basically, therefore, encourage one another and build one another up just as you're doing. So basically, Paul, Paul says like the day of the Lord's coming. Uh, it's going to happen 
real fast. You won't expect it. And so encourage one another like you guys are already doing. Yeah. And then Second Peter 3 has this whole section about the day of the Lord as well. And essentially, Peter says the exact same thing. He says the day of the Lord um, or, or sorry. Yeah. The day of the Lord will come like a thief and then the heavens will pass away and burned up, dissolved. Everything will be exposed. Um, he said, since all these things are thus to be dissolved, what sort of people ought you to be? In lives of holiness and godliness, waiting for and hastening the coming of the day of God. So he basically says, like, be holy and godly and encourage one another. Mm -hmm. And there's not like, and crack the code. It's like, no, just yeah. live mm -hmm. um, kingdom minded lives. Tell people about Jesus. Listen to take, the Holy Spirit. Take care of your family. Be a good employee. Like encourage, repent. Yeah. Uh, Adopt babies. Sure. Look after the poor. There's nothing yeah. like. And then, as you see the first sign, then stockpile food and like no. Yeah. It's just right. like no. The whole point actually of the entire book of Revelation is be faithful until I come back. Is what Jesus says to almost all the churches. Be faithful. Just be faithful mm -hmm. to the end. What does faithfulness look like? Everything we just said. Like yeah. love people. I, love your enemy. Live the Sermon on the Mount. Like do all these things. That's how you just faithfully. Yeah. I know people um, close in close relationship that I fear are just kind of sitting and waiting. Yeah. Like, I'm just being faithful. Well, you're not doing, doing anything. anything. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I think of the example of yeah. like, if you're on a plane flying somewhere and you unpacked your stuff and you got your laptop out, you got whatever out, you're doing all these things. You're, you're working, you're doing this stuff. If you don't listen to the announcements or recognize that you're about to land, you're not going to have anything packed up. You're not going to be prepared. So I'm not saying that we have to have certain things all in line for the end, end times, right? Like you don't have to make sure your laptop's packed in your bag, so to speak. But like there is an element of it's encouraging you to be prepared for that, right? Yeah. To know what's coming so that when it comes, you're ready. You're ready to get off the plane, so to speak, right? I like that. But Put your trade table in its full upright position. In the storage position, yeah. Yeah. But like... I have a good buddy who follows Christ and he's a pilot for a major airline. That'll be a day of the Lord. That yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That'll be interesting. I, I think the only thing that I would say to that though too is that it's not up to us to make sure we're all packed up and ready to go because the Holy Spirit has been given to us to help us with that. It's not... I can only think of it. Well, well, my bags are packed. I'm ready to go. Remember that song? Because <laughs> yeah. I'm leaving. Anyways. Is that from like the 20s? I think it's from Armageddon, oh, the movie. That. It is from Armageddon. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that fits. That's right. <laughs> so, I bet yeah. that movie was released when you were about three. Probably. You should look up. When was Armageddon released? Because when were you, what year were you born, Corlin? 1996. <laughs> 96. That was a good year. It was 97. <laughs> <laughs> I believe 96 is like the final year of millennials. Oh, no, it was 1998. Okay, Nin so you were two. Did you uh, see it in theaters? Probably. Yeah, <laughs> probably. I can see your parents taking you. <laughs> Anyways. Oh, man. No. <laughs> we should do like a, a podcast one week where me and Cam just say things that Corlin wouldn't understand. That'd be fun. See like, if I'm uh, cultured at all. Yeah, because I remember the one time I was like, oh, man, I heard a great Goo Goo Dolls song in the grocery store. And you were like what's that i'm like oh no <laughs> yeah. and i'm only 10 years older than you that's anyways Wild. so what 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 just happened we just went off the rails here so we would encourage you um like the bible says to not fall into the the trap of trying to crack the code or you know, this happens and then that happened and then this happened. So now I know exactly when the Antichrist will arise and blah, 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 blah. I just think that if I can be blunt is like a waste of time. Mm -hmm. And the Bible would call us to just live faithful, godly lives, submitted to Jesus, telling people about him. Um, and the day of the Lord, uh, like the end of Revelation says, um, we should all long for it. Mm -hmm. Right. And we should... Like it says, the spirit and the bride, which is the church, us say, come, right? Come, Lord Jesus. So we should, that should be our, that should be our cry, right? Okay, Jesus, we're ready. I remember when I was a single guy, like, oh, Jesus, don't come back yet. I want to get married first. Sure. But mm -hmm. it, all of us should be at a place where we go, 
yeah, come Lord Jesus, we're, we're ready. Um, and long for that day when yeah. um, it'll be perfect. So well ho- said. Hopefully that's uh, mm-hmm. encouraging and helpful to you. Um, if you do have um, topics or themes in the Bible that you'd like us to cover, um, please either comment on the YouTube video or you can message us. Um, and we would love to cover stuff that you would find uh, practical. And uh, hopefully this has been encouraging to you. And uh, like we end every time, make sure you subscribe on uh, YouTube or you can subscribe in iTunes or Google or Spotify. And then that way uh, you'll get notifications when we put out new episodes. And so that's it for us. Talk to you next week.